Larry Vickers here. This is the Larry Vickers podcast brought to you by Firearms Trainers Association. Now, we've got a special guest here. Actually, the first guest I've ever had on the Larry Vickers podcast. Up to now, they've all been me talking about guns and gear and whatnot. I have my buddy, Jason Burton of Heirloom Precision, who is a very well-known 1911 gunsmith out in Arizona. Good friend of mine, shot with him for a number of years. He's built me a number of guns. I consider to be one of the very best 1911 pistol smiths of all time. Thank you, my Brett, my friend, for joining us. You bet, man. Appreciate you having me on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Justin came up with a list of people to have on the, the podcast, and he had your in a list, and I went, absolutely. I'm all awesome. game for it. I appreciate it. it. I so, appreciate it. if you won't mind, just to set everybody up, we're... How did you get your start building 1911s? Where did it start? Just kind of set up your past so we can kind of give everybody a little bit of background. Yeah, I, um, you know, I was lucky that I got brought up in a house with guns. So, you know, my dad was a big gun guy um, and, you know, he was very into like sharps rifles, um, single action armies. And of course, 1911, he was in the army in the middle 60s. So he's a tank driver. So he got issued a 1911 and a grease gun, which is really cool as far as I'm concerned. And uh, so, you know, I got brought up shooting. And when I turned 21, I wasn't as much really enthused about going out to the bars and drinking. It's not that I didn't want to do that. But the idea for me was I was very, very into getting my concealed pistol license. I thought, you know, um, I like if I'm going to strap this gun on me, I should probably know how to use it. So one thing leads to another. You start shooting a little bit more. You kind of start figuring out what guns work for you, what guns don't work for you. Uh, you know, a way to carry them. And I kind of discovered the 1911. Uh, it's not that I didn't know about it. I'd, I'd obviously shot one before and I owned them, but I thought the gun was always going to be too big to carry. Mm -hmm. But I dove right in. I got a good holster, a good carry system, started carrying the gun, shooting the gun a whole bunch and realized, man, this is, this thing's really cool. So I progressed from a production gun to a semi-custom gun, finally discovering custom guns. And I bought a, uh, in like the early 2000s, I bought a used Swenson gun. Mm -hmm. It was my first custom gun, okay? And, you know, once I saw what really could be done with the platform, I was just, you know, I was bought and paid for right then and there. I thought, mm -hmm. this is so cool. So I discovered other custom makers, and I just had a goal that I wanted to dive right into this thing. Fast forward to about 2005, I got an opportunity to sell my business that I had in Washington, move to Arizona, and dive right into building custom 1911s. So, I mean, that's 15 years ago now. And my goal has kind of been every day that I get to build a gun, I want to be better than I was the day before. Mm -hmm. I want to focus on a way to improve my craft, never stop learning and never be satisfied with the end result. No matter how good it is, it can always be a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of been my mindset with regards to building guns. Excellent. So you've been going at it full time since 2005? Yeah, full time okay. since 05. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, now, I'm lucky every day to do it. I love my job, man. I really love what I do. Oh, I know. Every time I talk to you, every time I come out there and I do one of my joint classes with Latham, I come by yeah. and say hi, and you say that every time. Cuz man, yeah. I I love coming to work every day. I don't regret it at all. I love what I'm doing. Yeah. Now, let me a couple I'm things. Yeah. I would imagine by now you get a lot of repeat business. I do. I mean, yeah. I know. Yeah, a significant amount. I mean, uh, lots. Yeah. Yeah. Like Jim Garthwaite, who's recently passed away. Um, yeah. Sad to see him go. Long time 1911 Pistol Smith. Very well known. Very well respected. Well liked. Yeah. I remember my buddy Hackathorn run into him one time. Shot you or somewhere and he was talking to him. He said, I haven't heard much from you, Jim. He goes, Jim goes, I I've got so much business, business from repeat customers. I don't advertise. I'm, I'm just covered up just doing guns for people that come back and want a second, third or fourth or fifth gun. And I was thinking about that today before we started this podcast. I will bet you're getting in that same boat. You're getting new customers, sure. but you probably, you could probably almost just do your work with repeat customers. Yeah. It, especially the last five years, it really seems like it. Um, I actually stopped taking on new clients two years ago. Okay. Because I, you know, I looked in the safe, even in my office, I got those two safes in the office. Right. And so like, I looked in one of the safes and I thought, how am I ever going to get through all this work? You know, I'm, I, and again, I'm, this is a little bit like crying in my beer, right? A little, you know, I, I'm lucky to have the work, but I look at 
those guns that are in the shop right now, so many of them, probably 70% is repeat customers. Yeah, I figured as much. Yeah. Now, yeah. what do you mainly build, right? I know 45 ACP and whatnot, but what's the main thrust of the guns you build? What's some of the variations that you're willing to do? And then what's some stuff that you're not really a fan of doing, like you try to stay stay away from? Yeah, 45 ACP government models. I mean, that still is going to be 70% of what people ask me to build for them. Steel frame, uh, generally on Colts or Springfields. Um, I, and I would also say that that's the thing I like doing the most. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a classic gun, right? You can polish blue it, you can hard chrome it, you can make a two-tone gun. It can be kind of anything you want it to be with lots of styling choices thrown in there. Um, stuff I get asked for also, uh, nine millimeter, I mean, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Where's oh, that yeah, come from? Yeah. Not like tons. You know, I've done more nine millimeters probably in the last three or four years than all of the years combined before that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a high volume guy. I mean, I'm not, I, I, I work every day, but I'm not, you know, I'm not making 20 guns a year. Right. So um, to see how the nine millimeter has, has risen up in terms of popularity with the 1911, uh, which I think is, has a lot to do with the kind of solve the magazine problem yeah. and stuff like that. Um, but I do a lot of nine and I would say that of the nine millimeters, half or better are commanders. Mm -hmm. Guys like lightweight commanders in nine. And I think it's a lot, it is still a logical choice. I'm still a government model guy. I still sure. like 45 ACP. I still shoot in that division in IDPA. I'm still shooting CDP, but um, I can see why guys want nine millimeter, nine yeah. uh, And then things I won't do, I won't build an officer's length gun. Uh, it's too short. Yeah, um, agreed. I'm okay with a, a CCO, you know, a commander top with an officer's frame. And I like those in nine millimeter, not so much fan in 45, but um, I don't really do any wide body stuff either. I've done yeah. a couple, um, but it's just, it, I guess it's, it's just not what I wanted. Yeah. I don't want people to see it and have that be the representation of my work. Yeah. I think I would like people to see classically styled blued or two-tone guns and think okay that's that's what he did he right. put guns like that do you ever build any in 40 smith and wesson or in 10 mil 10 mil yep you bet uh 40 really don't get any call for it yeah I, i've never you seen as much of 40 for yeah some rob latham is mr 40. yeah we love rob but sometimes we got to remember you know he needs adult supervision 24 7. <laughs> Yeah, he's the only guy I know that still uses 40. I mean, everybody yeah. has kind of hit the leap button on that. So I would have been shocked if he said, oh, yeah, I build 40 1911s. I yeah. would have been surprised. How often do you get yeah. requests for 10 mil? Maybe one a year yeah. maybe, or one every 18 months. Even. Mm -hmm. Not now, that often. Are those built on Delta Elites or are they something you do kind of a, with a different slide and frame? Generally Delta Elite or on Springfield frames. And then, you know, they still build a slide that, you know, they've got, they came out with 10 millimeter a few years ago. So they have slides that have the correct reach base and I can get frames and slides from them. Generally speaking, people will send in a Delta Elite. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now, me, I know you hand cut your check ring. Yep. Uh, 30 LPI is the norm. Get you normally? Yeah, most, yeah. More people ask for 30 than anything else. And then from there, 25. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was building 1911s back in the day, 25 didn't exist. It would have yeah. been the great compromise checkering. It would have been awesome, but it didn't exist. There wasn't 25 yeah. LPI checkering files. There was just no way to do it. Until Pete Singles started doing it, you know, via machine, you couldn't get it. You know, yep. There was no yep. files and whatnot. That sites you normally use or, or the site that you basically make in house or what is that where does your site come from uh generally i start with a heine slant pro and then I'll, I'll i'll modify the shape of it a little bit narrow it up front to back so that it changes the sweep and i take the rear leg off of it and not because there's anything wrong with the rear leg that's on it i like to take the rear leg off because then if if when a guy gets the gun he shoots enough rounds through it if the firing can stop right he doesn't have to shorten a firing can stop yeah. one in. Yeah, you're right. You can stick a standard length one in. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, 
what if you don't mind what's some of the components that you end up using like if you, if you get a colt like say a newer colt do you use like the stock extractor and stuff like that or do you normally swap that stuff out generally i'll use a wilson combat bulletproof extractor um and, I, and you know it's easier to say the parts i keep i guess from a colt than the parts i don't keep right so frame and slide off uh the pins are good uh so you know hammer sear uh mainspring housing pin uh, the main spring itself in 45 ACPs. I like a 23 pound main spring in the gun. Um, the recoil system, so the plug and the guide, although I will put a different recoil spring in it uh, to make sure that I'm getting the poundage that I want. Um, firing pin, um, plunger tube detent assembly, sometimes a slide stop, depending on the project, sometimes mm -hmm. a slide stop. Um, and that's pretty much it. Everything else goes to the wayside and get to fit brand new. Got it. Now you mainly do, I, what I see, I follow your stuff on Instagram and whatnot. I, I see a lot of polished blued guns. Is that pretty typical? Very typical. Yeah. yeah. Very and second typical. to that, I would assume would be two-tone. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Second to that's two-tones. Now- Polished blue, 70%, two tones, maybe 25%, and then the other 5% would be hard chrome gun. Yeah. Now. I just did a segment here earlier on a gun I built years ago, kind of in the style of the Delta 1911 on a stainless gun. As far as I know, it's the only stainless 45 ACP I ever built, and I never wanted to build one again. Um, do you do build many on stainless at all? Do you do many in, uh, in that platform? I will. Yeah, there's the gun right here, as a matter of fact. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll do it if somebody wants it, right? Um, I'm trying to think if there's any stainless guns in the shop to get built. I think I got one to build right now. And I think the last full stainless gun that I did was four years ago and it was a Delta Elite. Now do you, uh, what I've seen when I've fitted these up is they gall and they're horrendous to try to get a good slide to frame foot on. I mean, they're just horrendous. Yeah, it's, it's my worst fear with stainless guns, right? You get a great frame and slide fit and then somewhere else in the build, you know, you push up a burr or something gets oh, caught man. in there and it wants to tear the material. And even with like, you know, so I'll do a weld up frame and slide and I'll recut all the raceways in the slide. So everything is absolutely arrow straight. But um, stainless guns are, they're either, they're either really, really, really well fit, right? Where you're like, amazing how great you could get this thing to fit. Or you look at them and you're like, I left it loose because it's stainless. And then they got to heat up too. The thing that a lot of people forget is that you know, if you go out and shoot the gun a whole bunch, just put a hundred consecutive rounds through the gun and see how hot it gets. A lot of people don't recognize that that is going to be an element you have to take into consideration when talking about the material of the frame and how it, how the tightness of the frame is applied is affected by the heat. That's I mean, a good point. It, it's a whole different animal. Stainless. Yeah, big time. I, I generally stay away from them. My theory behind it was, one, if you want a stainless look, try to go down the path of like a hard chrome gun. And it, granted, it is a little bit different. It has a little bit different sheen to it. And then my theory would be, if you want something stainless, do a stainless frame and a blued slide. But yeah, the, uh, doing it all stainless gun was nightmarish. I've only ever built two, and both of them had galling issues with the with the slide to frame fit. And I, yep. I had a student come to my gunsmith class a few years ago. I don't know what I was thinking. I must have been off my meds, or it was a boomer moment. But he emailed me through the host and said, hey, my, um, you know, the guy wants to bring a stainless slide and frame instead of the Caspian carbon steel. Is that okay? And I, like I said, I had one of those boomer moments. I go, yeah, that's all right. That thing galled, he, he had a nightmare getting that thing fitted and reminded me why. And of course, now I remember it, I'll never allow another one in my gunsmith class, but he had an absolute nightmare trying to get that yeah. thing fit up. Yeah. Yeah, big time. Well, um, I'll give you an idea. I don't even own a stainless gun. Mm -hmm. Like I don't even own. I, I just I don't have any love for them. I'm with you 100. percent If I want the look, just I'll take a hard chrome yeah. gun. Carbon steel gun fit up well and then finished in hard chrome is about as good as you can get for a real functional gun that has really good wear properties in terms of abrasion resistance mm -hmm. and good corrosion resistance. Now on that note, who are you using for hard chrome, chrome these days? Who do you use? Uh, Terry Wolford in Florida. Okay, cool. Um, I used Metalloy back in the day. I don't. Are they even still in business, Metalloy? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. I believe so. 
Um, it's interesting because I've been doing it, I, you know, I did pistol smithing several years ago and then, you know, I've been teaching and all that, but it's interesting. It's in some cases, all I even did it when I was talking about this pistol earlier on the earlier podcast is I'll bring up stuff like, well, I'm not sure they're still in business. Or I think like, for instance, I use the King's thumb safety. I think King's is no longer in business, are they? No, they're done. Yeah. yeah. They're so yeah. some of my stuff's dated. Like I didn't know if Metalloy was still in business. So I'm, I'm kind of dated on that side. What barrels do you normally use? I like carts mm -hmm. um, and I, I like carts and bars though. I think bars still, still makes a good barrel. In fact, I rebarreled one of my personal guns, the gun I shoot a lot. Um, and put a bar stow in it in part because I didn't want to have to blue a barrel. So I just figured, well, I'll fit the barrel, fit a new bushing and it's stainless and I can just finish it right there. Um, I like cart barrels and at, recently I've been getting cart barrels that are short chambered as well. So it allows me to fit the barrel the way I want, equalize the radial lock and lug, and then I can control the final headspace dimension versus you know, relying on how deep their chamber was and whatever my barrel extension ends up being in terms of length then is now going to determine my headspace. I don't have to do that. So um, I, if I had to pick one barrel for the rest of my life, I would just use a cart. Cool. And it's interesting. You hit on something that I talked about earlier is you got to remember cart barrels are crow molly and they'll, they'll rust. They'll rust yeah. if you don't stay on, especially if you're a guy that's used to Barstow's or Wilson's or a stainless barrel that you can abuse and it doesn't rust. Now they go to a cart and it will absolutely rust. So you normally, correct me if I'm wrong, when you're using a cart, you normally blew the barrel to get some corrosion. Yeah. Yep. That's yeah, correct. it's interesting. Yep. And now you're in Arizona, so rust isn't that much of an issue, but you go elsewhere in the country and yeah. I've seen them rust before. And they're like, my God, what's yeah. that? I didn't know it rust. I thought it was stainless. It's like, no, nah, dude, that's carbon steel in the white. Yep. It's not stainless. Yeah. 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 Uh, yep. And now do you, in nine mil, what do you still use uh cart or do you use bar still? What do you use in nine mil? I'll, I'll use either one, but the cart barrels, generally speaking, you know, I'll order them direct from cart with a Clark para ramp. I like, I like that ramp dimension. I'll use a Clark para and then, um, you know, they send them to me and I get to fit them up to the guns. Now you mentioned ramp. I'm a big fan of ramp barrel in, in nine mil. I mean, I, For to sure. me, yeah, absolutely. Then you mentioned earlier the magazine part of the house in terms of nine mil. We've talked about this before, but I believe you're, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you're really talking about Wilson. Wilson yeah. really cracked the code on the nine mil mag. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, and there's a lot of good, look, I, so Metal Form was making nine millimeter magazines that have the feed ramp, the dimpled feed ramp in the front of the two. That's really the thing to, to get, right? And in fact, credit where it's due, Rob, way back in the day, started having magazines yes. or modifying yep. them. In fact, he gave me some of his prototypes. I got some of his original prototype nine millimeter magazines. But things they had to figure out is like, how thick does the spacer need to be, right? Because some ammo will vary in overall length. And you need to, how long can the tube be? You know, you want to be able to seat it, especially guys that are shooting USPSA. They want to be able to seat the magazine on a closed slide with a full 10 rounds in the magazine. But Wilson has done a great job of producing a magazine that is functional. So it's got all the key components we want, the follower we want, the dimple in the front of the feed ramp, it's a long enough tube, and it's got the right length spacer, and their quality control is fantastic. Right. I mean, their quality control is, those magazines, they're what I send out with every gun. Yeah. Not. I agree, they're dynamite. That was really the game changer. Well, one, you had so many be people building them now, they really fixed up, figured out like the extractor tension and there was the nuances in terms of actually building them They've because they built so many and then the magazine came along and man, I mean, I remember when I got some of the Wilson ones and it would feed hollow points because it used to be back in the day, a nine mil, 1911 was a, was a ball only gun. The last yeah. thing you did is put any kind of hollow points in it. Yeah. I've had like a 1911, my Wilson combat and you can run hollow points in it. I went, oh man, game changer. Yeah. And well, and, and I think that, too, is one of those things that really made other people go and search out a 9mm 1911. I mean, look, you and I are unabashed 1911 guys. Okay, We're mm -hmm. always going to be fans of the platform, not just because of our history with the platform, but also because we recognize that it is still a superior shooting tool. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, nothing else shoots like it, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. So now you combine that with ammo that costs less, ammo that recoils less, okay? 
And again, you get extended capacity with a nine millimeter and the ability to feed good quality ammo. It does make a nine millimeter a really logical choice. Yeah, it and, sure does. You know, you had touched you had touched on the extractor. You know, the extractor really is another key component to the platform in general, but especially in nine millimeter because it's got to move further in on the breech face to get the rim. So having an extractor that's tall enough that has enough hook depth to be able to hold onto the case, that's when you can solve those both those problems in the 1911 you can make a nine millimeter work really well. What's amazing to me is, and anybody out there watching this who's never shot a nine millimeter 1911, man, you've got to. They are, it has to be, especially a five inch steel frame, nine millimeter 1911 has to be the softest shooting center fire handgun in the world, in the world. Yeah. I cannot think of anything to the point that if I shoot them too much for too long, man, and I pick up something like a Glock or something else, it is a real yeah. wake up call. Uh, yeah. So I try to shy away from them. Uh, and I've kind of went down the realm now of the commander, lightweight commander. Because, yeah, it may not quite as soft shooting as the five-inch steel, but it's just yeah. a great all-around platform for that gun. Really great. A little bit lighter to carry. I mean, it's the yeah. nine mil commander lightweight is dynamite. Well, I think, a ni- I think a lightweight commander points better than a steel commander. I think a steel five-inch gun is a really well-balanced gun. But I think as soon as you lop off three quarters of an inch off the muzzle, you need to lighten the butt end of the gun. And I so I think lightweight commanders point and shoot better than than steel commanders. But I wouldn't want a lightweight commander in a 45. Yeah. And again, I'm I'm an unabashed 45 ACP guy, right? I'm still toting around a five inch government model every day. But if I was to go to a lightweight commander, it would be a nine millimeter. Mm-hmm. What is it you get? You and Rob call it God's gun. And yeah. What do you call 45 ACP? What do you call it? You call it a uh, what was the thing we thought of? I'm trying to remember now. What was it we said? Um, I don't know. It was real ball or something. Oh, uh, yeah, man. Um, now, I, I can't remember. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm, try I'll to go remember that. I, knew, I remember the God's yeah. gun part. And then you yeah. came up with a name for shooting 45 ACP, which was like, yeah. you know. Full ball. Full ball. Full, yeah, that's full it. Full ball. Nine millimeters is half ball. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> Yeah, it's full ball. ball. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, so now sights. I know you. One of the things you do on your front sight, you like to do that gold stripe, vertical stripe, right? So it's like yeah, kind of I a do. variation on the gold bead. But you do. Yeah. A, how do how do now that's real gold. Yep. Right. Yep. And then ha, yep. so how does that go about doing that? Something you insert yourself, and then how does that all work through? So once I've got the gun zero, so right, I, I, I got built the gun to the point where I put the sights in, I've machined the sight to height, and I've gone and tested it at 25 yards. So I know that it shoots where it looks, okay? I'll take the sight out, and then I machine a, a, a channel up the face of the sight. From there, I, I basically cut a dovetail on the back side, and then the gold gets inlaid and pounded in place, and then the face of the sight gets serrated. So the gold sort of acts like an arrow that points you to the top of the front sight. It's, it's quick to reference, um, but it also gives you a definitive reference point to the top of the front sight. So for a gun that's correctly zeroed, and again, I like to zero my guns at 25 yards to have the bullet impact directly on top of the front sight. God bless you. Anywhere from zero to 25, if you just, whatever you want to hit, just put on top of that gold line. And as long as you don't move the gun when you press the trigger, you can hit it. Yeah, God bless you. That's exactly the way I like it. I mean, I have done that from back in the day with Hackathorn where you dot the yeah. eye and the it impacts right on top of the front sight. You see so much now where manufacturers do that deal where the front dot or whatever covers up the bullet impact point. And I've never liked that. I've never so, liked so that. So that's actually crazy. And it's funny because Ken and I were talking about exactly the same thing a few weeks ago in regards to zeroing his gun. And like, don't not to have the point of impact be under the gold bead. He wants a gold bead, right? And I'm like, oh, I would never do that. It, because there's no logic in yeah. why would you cover up the thing you want to hit? How do you exactly. know? Exactly. I don't. That? I'm with you. And you see, manufacturer Sig does that. HK does it. It's real common yeah. now. Real common do it. Where you bring it up, you line up the dots, and wherever the dot is, the bullet goes. And I've never liked that. I don't want. I do not right. want to cover up the thing I want to be hitting. I agree 100. percent Now, one of the things, I, I, my personal opinion is. Fiber optics great, but and when I think fiber optic, I think Glock, 
I think one of the other guns, I really don't think of a 1911. I mean, it's perfectly usable and whatnot and a competition gun, but on a classy 1911, when you're spending a lot of money on it, I just can't see a fiber optic front sight on it. That's where your gold stripe comes in, a gold bead. But one thing you did for me recently, which, which was killer, was you did an insert. So it gave me an HD style front sight. That was really cool. How did you yeah. come about doing that? Well, um, the HD site was sort of the inspiration for it. And I had looked at a couple of different things. So we go back even further, right? Uh, Smith & Wesson for a long time put the red ramp, the orange ramp inserts, right? Yeah, right, okay. yeah, when the so, wheel guns. And what they would leave is, you know, you look at an old Smith & Wesson 29, it was inserted underneath the tip of the front sight. So you could still get a really precise sight picture, but if you wanted speed with it, the orange or the red ramp that was there gave you a very fast reference to the front sight. And then I looked at, I had some Devel back in the day, right? So I had some Devel 39s and 59s. And they actually had a ramp front sight that had a painted red insert. And it was U-shaped on the bottom, but flat on the top. Again, the same idea was a really fast reference. So I built a gun for a guy who wanted a Trigicon HD but the HDs only came in like two sight height. And then the width of the HD was like 150,000 wide. Really wide, yeah. So, you know, for me, zeroing a gun at 25 yards, looking at an IPSC target or USPSA target or whatever, right? Um, that covered all of the AZO with my individual sight radius, holding the gun, looking at where the front sight was gonna be. A 150 wide front sight takes up six inches of the target at it's, 25 yeah, yards. So yeah. I thought, well, why don't I just cut a U-shaped notch in there and then drill the hole for a tritium vial and then paint the notch and then insert the tritium vial. So that's, I mean, that's basically what I did. And then on, I think on your gun, I omitted the tritium, right? We, we, did, we left the tritium off on your yeah, gun. Yeah, sure I did. Mm -hmm. Just the paint. So I've been able to do them both ways, which, and, and I've actually figured out a way now, instead of using paint, to use like um, safety orange colored G10. Cool. And have and that you, be the insert. You, and you put it in like with a dovetail type of thing. How does that? Yeah. Yep. And then the tritium vial, then the tritium vial can go in if somebody wants a tritium vial. And uh, so you kind of get the best of both worlds. Because again, I don't want a really wide front sight. I'm shooting a no. hundred wide front sight still. Um, and on, or a hundred on one gun, 110 on another. But I don't, I don't even want a 125 for me anymore. I like them skinny. And God, I absolutely don't want 150,000. No. It's like looking at a brick on the top of your gun. Yeah, I, I'm a little bit older, so I like the 125 because of my eyesight. But the, I'm with you. The 140 or the 150 is just too big. Yeah, way too big. Yep, way too big. Now you're a big Swenson guy. I know that. And like your email, like you, you have like a Swenson email or something on it. Or something. Yeah, Swenson fan. Yeah. 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 Where did, well, you told me that was the first custom gun you got. And what's the inspiration you got from Swenson and how many do you own now? Um, so I only have two now. At my highest, I think I had 10 at one time. Um, and I had some really cool, some really old ones. I had one that was a two tone gun built on a 68 plant group Colt commercial. That was wow. a really cool gun. Yeah. Um, and, but Swenson was kind of the first guy I discovered. So, he was a little bit, I mean, in fairness to him, I mean, the, if you look at the work for what it is now, it does, it pales in comparison to what sure. we're doing now. But we were able to learn things from their uh, from their ability, not only Swenson, but guys like Jim Hogue, the guys at Packmire, stuff like that, from their ability to innovate without a huge parts market like we have yeah, now. That's they right. had to solve problems in a whole nother way. You know, Swenson had to figure out a way to, uh, to, to, uh, get a constant position of the barrel inside the slide. So he became really interesting to me because he looked at the problem, I think, from another angle. And he was important because of his relative, his location uh, relative to the Southwest Combat Pistol. So he kind of got direct feedback from shooters. They told him the things they wanted the guns to do. And he figured out a way to solve the problem that they had. You know, the ambi safe, square and checkered trigger guards. He invented the shock buff, as far as I know. He was the first guy to put to put um, bump or put pads on the bottom of magazines to help keep them. Um, so he just was always an interesting character to me. I think his work spanned enough, a long enough period of time with a uh, diverse enough cadre of shooters to where he got to learn from the guys that were pressing the trigger. 
Yeah, big time. Ackathorn's mentioned him many times. I guess he used to zero his guns. He had a uh, opt a scope. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Didn't he have a scope on a on a um, basically a mount that that bolted to the side of the gun? It replaced a grip panel. And then yeah. Ken said he'd shoot him one handed using the scope. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. He, he would. He, he that's the same thing I heard. Same exact thing. And and he would send test targets. Yep, ten detect. They clipped off. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Pretty cool. And the vast majority of his guns were hard chromed, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then he, yeah. have you ever tried to do, because he, Hackathorn was telling me, and he got a really, I wish Ken would write a book on this. I mean, I really wish he would before, you know, we don't have him anymore. But he was saying, you know, what's kind of interesting is you have the Swenson side of the house, which almost has that Germanic, um, you know, old Germanic style hand craftsmanship where you can tell it's well done, but you can tell it has been worked by hand. Oh, Whereas yeah. like, you know, the texturing on top of the slide and all that kind of stuff. And then you kind of had the Jim Hogue thing and then the Richard Heine thing where the stuff is real cleanly executed, where you almost like it, it came from the factory that way. And that's kind of the yeah. two. Have you ever tried any of the Swenson stuff like the texturing? on? And you basically are following, like I did, I followed the Hogue, Heine, kind of approach yeah. where the stuff comes in, where, you know, it, you look at it and it looks like it came that way from the factory. It doesn't have that obvious handwork. And that's obviously yeah. the vein you've ever been. Have you ever tried any of the Swenson stuff where you like do the texturing on top of the slide or any of that? Yeah, I've done it. I've done it on many guns. And, and you know, he used to do it with a, uh, with a file and a hammer. You know, he would lay the file on the slide. Top. Yeah. As he turned the file, he would hit it with a hammer and it would produce that that you know that long granular pattern um but and i've even done that i rebuilt the swenson gun about a year and a half ago and it had lost its barrel positioner the barrel positioner came loose came out the top so i had to fabricate a new barrel positioner install it and then map the slide top to match so i could blend the barrel positioner in hmm. so i've kind of done it all the ways but i totally agree with what you're saying in terms of you know swenson did things that were you know they not to, again, not to diminish his importance, but they were crude compared to the guys who came next. So guys like Hogue looked at his stuff and said, okay, that's really cool what he's doing there, right? The ambi safety, the squared trigger guard. But then he did it better. And guys like Heine then, again, the next step up. I mean, you really can connect the eras of pistol smithing kind of in those three things. And I would throw Packmeyer in there as well. Yeah, um, for you know, sure. From the idea of having a multi-man shop. Mm -hmm. where they were building a gun that, I mean, you know, after what, 81, the combat special became the thing everybody wanted. Big time. And now, yeah. and weren't they really the ones that pioneered the two-tone gun? Was it comp? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, for so yeah. You, any two-tone gun kind of has that lineage. Yeah. 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 No Ken, doubt about it. One of Ken's biggest regrets is, you know, he's got a gorgeous uh, Packmire combat special two-tone gun. And then, you know, they, one of the, they do one of those deals where Rob's got one too, and it has your name on it. Well, yep. Ken never did that. Cause he's like, well, I don't want to have my name on it, which of course now you go, do you yeah. realize how much more, more, how much more valuable that gun would be? Yeah. Um, you know, another thing is what's interesting is like, you know, I remember getting the Packmire worksheet years ago and there was all these different levels of guns. And like Ken said, you know, most people got the base level. Didn't have a beaver tail, had to pack my wraparound grips, all that kind of stuff. And Bill Wilson was talking about, and he certainly, I know now he's rectified it, it how incredibly difficult it was to find, it, it, to find, he wanted one for his collection, a high-end version that had the oh, yeah. checkering and all that in the custom beaver tail and all that on the pac Combat Special. They were not easy to find at all. Yeah. Well, and those guns... So if you go back and you look at the pac catalog from like 83, and then I think they updated it 85 or 86. If you look at the, the cost of those guns, they were expensive guns back then. I think the base price for a combat special in 85 was still like $1,400. Yeah. You know? Um, and I mean, that was a lot of money for those. And then you oh, look at yes. the, the, what the cost options were, like if you wanted it, uh, like the beaver tail, right? Or if you wanted the slide top serrated, um, you know, or even just the built core, you know, custom built core, you know, all of those things. So there are a lot of those guns out there that are just sort of what we would call base model pack mark yeah. combat special, not yeah. necessarily, you know, a, a full tilt job. You know, you could get the wide link and the, remember they had the slide stop that had the interchangeable link, uh, uh, slide stop pins. 
Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the, the sky was the limit at Packfire. Yeah, pretty cool, man. Pretty cool. I That 50th birthday gun you built of mine kind of was inspired by the Packmire Combat Special in a way. Two-tone. Yeah. We kind of yep. replicated that beaver tail look yeah. and whatnot. Yeah, that was a cool yep. gun. Yeah, um, that, that was the first gun I ever did with a squared guard. That oh, really? Yep, that wow. was my first squared guard. Yep. How many have you done since? Is that pretty oh, common? a bazillion. Yeah, really? lots. Lot. I and like doing them because, you know, they're a challenge to make them look like they grew right there on the gun. It goes back to that. Make it look like it left that way kind yeah. of idea um that lots in fact i've probably built uh three or four exactly like yours where a guy was like hey i just want one of these yeah i mean uh, to me this i don't use a finger forward or none of that crap i think it just looks cool with a square guard i mean i really yeah. do i think it's a cool yeah. looking gun uh without a doubt so what do you got cooking right now? What, what, what do you have on the workbench? What do you have on the horizon? Because I know recently, not too long ago, you built the, the, the Decennial. Am I saying that right? You built kind of yep. your 10th anniversary gun? Yep. Yeah. Right? And of course, you know, typical for a custom pistol smith, it took me two years to build my 10th anniversary gun, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I started that project in, you know, in 2015 and I finished the gun in late 2017. Um, and right now, so I'm actually finishing a gun for Ken right now, uh, on a 68 AMU Polk commercial, uh, blue gun, but with a square guard, pretty cool gun. Of course, it'll have ivory grip, very true to Ken. Yeah, um, for sure. And, um, I've got a special project I'm doing for the guys at Milk Spark and that very shortly to finish up. And then somebody's going to get a custom 210 here pretty quick as well. Cool. Excellent. Yeah, that'll be, a, that'll be a one of a kind. One of a kind, yeah. Waiting for people yeah. to beat, beat you up over that. I saw Larry's. Yeah. Can can I get one? And the answer is, uh, yeah. no, unfortunately. Yeah, it's no. cool. Cool gun. Oh, yeah, cool gun. Yeah, that American-made P210, especially for the yeah. money, is a fantastic gun. For it's sure. Very impressive. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, that's about all I can think of, man. Justin, you got any suggestions? Yeah, I had a question for Jason. Jump um, in here, bro. What's your machining background? Did you have a machining background before you started smithing, or did would you pick it up where you needed as you needed it, or how did it work? Um, I have a little joke that I answer that with. I'll give you the joke first, and I'll give you the truth. I machine <laughs> like a barbarian. Um, so I didn't have a machining background. I learned how to machine kind of around the platform. And, but from there, you, you pick things up. You know, you learn how fixturing works and repeatable fixturing and better ways to do repeatable fixturing. And from there, you can come up with new ways to modify the gun or ways to improve things you want to do. Like my barrel fits have changed dramatically over the last 10 years because through machining, I've been able to do things I just couldn't do without like a reinvestment in tooling or a reinvestment in machining. So I know machining, and I tell people this really freely, I know machining around the platform but I'm, I'm not a machinist, but I can do things on a machine. Yeah. Got it. Do what you need to do for the guns. Cool. Yeah, and maybe a little bit more. I mean, you know, obviously there's things I don't do on the 1911 that I know. I mean, I can thread. I can do all that stuff. I can fabricate parts. But a lot of that is born out of having learned machining around the platform versus having been a machinist and then dove into the platform. Hmm. You mentioned threading. And uh, I just have you have you ever done a threaded barrel gun? No, no one's ever asked me for one. Huh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, one other question I had. Um, what do you, what are your most of your triggers set at when they leave? Do you get guys like Rob who want super light triggers or you send them most of them out, what, three to four pounds or how, or do you set it whatever they want? I mean, how, what's, how's the triggers work? Generally three to four pounds. I, I like about a three pound trigger personally. Okay. Um, and most guys want, most guys just say, Hey, I'd like a four pound trigger. I think the gun becomes a little bit more usable with a three and a half pound trigger without being so light that it's going to, you know, surprise somebody when it goes off. Um, generally I don't get requests for Rob style triggers. Yeah, I, 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 you know, yeah. He, you know, we're, <laughs> his triggers are light. Yeah, they are. Oh, Rob, what a piece of work. There's only going to be ever one Rob Latham. And you know what I'd say? Thank God. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you. Uh, uh, one more. Uh, about how many guns a year do you do? Does it vary oh, or? Man. 
Um, yeah, it does because every project takes a different amount of time. I clock every job kind of by hours, right? So I keep track of how many hours I have invested in the gun. I'm never really in a hurry to get from one gun to the next. Gun's got to be done as far as I'm concerned. So I don't look at guns like I got to do one every two weeks or I got to do this many a quarter. I think last year, I think I built 14 guns. Yeah, wow. 15 guns, so not that many. Yeah. Um, they're really time intensive. You know, again, I Big contrast like now 10 years ago. Um the guns are a totally different animal. I've just figured out how to do things I, that I think makes the gun better from a long-term perspective. But the time investment in the build, of course, then- Well, that's it. it. I, every time I do one of these gunsmith classes, and I haven't done one now for a couple of years, but I do one about once a year-ish, and I get in the middle of them, it reminds me, they are so time intensive, it's not even funny. It's off the chart. People, yep. and, you know, they look at, you know, what, what one of these guns costs and they're very expensive, but you go, but when they see the amount of time that goes in it, they're like, oh my God, I'm surprised you're not charging more. There's a yeah. lot of time and effort to go into these things. Big time. Yep. Yeah. Big I, time. I think the last gun that I finished, the last gun I delivered, I had like 140 hours. Wow. Case in point, do the math on what you should really be charging. And actually, when you look at that, and that it's, it's a bargain to be really yeah. honest with you. Yeah, for the for that type of skilled labor, it's so unique. Hey, yeah. um, one last question for me: Do you ever see Bomar sights anymore? Do you have, does anybody want those? Is there, are they? St I haven't seen hardly anybody building with a Bomar anymore. Yeah, um, I'll still do you know one again every eighteen months or so. Um, and when I do though, it's generally for a guy who also wants the Bomar to complete a look for the gun, like a squared and checkered for your card. Yep. I get a lot of, in fact, I think the last three Bomar installs I did were all on guns that they wanted a squared and checkered trigger guard, and they wanted it to be a two-tone gun, and they wanted a beaver tail that wasn't necessarily like the one on your gun, but didn't have a hump. So they wanted the gun to look more, I guess we would call that maybe a, a middle 90s style yeah. gun, you know, mm -hmm. where those things were all still really common on custom guns. Yeah. When I guess... Because Bomar's been out of business now for many years, right? Yeah, and there's, yep, for a long while. There's a few variations on the market of it, but I would guess for the guys that want those style of guns, I mean, you can source them, you can find them, especially if it's something you're only building once in a blue moon. Yep, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the Champion site and EGW makes one. Well, I didn't, know, EG, I didn't yeah. know EGW made one. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're sort of the, the, the new replacement for the Bomar. Um, but I, I'm lucky. I buy Bomars whenever I see them, and I just stick them aside. Because, sure. again, you know, if a guy sends me a, hey, I got a 68 Colt commercial, right? And I want to build a squared and checkered trigger guard, two-tone, ambi safety, retro-style gun, I'd like it to say Bomar. Without a doubt. Yeah, I agree 100%. Fortunately, that's something you don't have to build all the time, or you'd run out yeah. of Bomars pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, and they're and of course they take three times as much, three times as long to install as a Heine does. You know, to machine the, the pocket and then to thread it for the elevate, elevator screw. You know, um, they're cool. I like them because of what they represent, and I think on a gun that is again retro style, sort of a period piece, a theme gun, they go really well. I still would rather have a fixed sight on a Same gun. Same here. But, I agree. Yeah, hundred percent, and I agree with your feelings. It's you know like a retro theme deal. Hey, yep. before we go, I want to hit on yep. gun leather. You hit it earlier, gun leather. I know you are a big fan of gun leather. You collect the stuff. You got a lot yeah. of knowledge on it. What, can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, you know, it's sort of, uh, it, I, I think they go hand in hand with 1911. I mean, oh, yeah. I got into holsters because I needed a good holster to carry a, a, a 1911 in. So my first good holster was a Milk Spark Summer Special. I mean, 24 years ago now, I bought my first summer special, right? And I still have it. I've used it a lot. Um, that led me to other makers, you know, guys like Matt Del Fatty, mm -hmm. a very boutique maker, kind of does what I do, really doing one-off custom stuff. Eric Little, uh, who is in Montana, John Ralston at Five Shot, uh, Josh Bullman, who's in Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the best guys I ever knew in my life was Lou Alessi before he died. And, you know, he was sort of that, that uh, the prince of the industry, we used to call him. But, you know, I've been able to have a, a, a good complement of fine gun leather 
And then, of course, you start looking for older stuff. Like I had a huge Bruce Nelson collection mm-hmm. for years. I mean, I had everything from him and I would search that stuff out. And, you know, it pushed me off in, in, into different areas, looking for different makers. But for me, it's always been that that goes hand in hand with 1911. It's a really good leather holster that has some historical importance fits really well with a polished piece. I agree 100%. To me, the classic 1911 pieces are one, you not, not have a fiber optic front. I mean, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but fiber optic front to me is not a 1911 thing. I would tell people to look at something in the HD realm before you do mm-hmm. fiber optic and also mm-hmm. a leather holster. I mean, Kydex is cool. Yeah. I've used it for a number of years and variety of pistols. But when I think a Kydex with a 1911, it just doesn't go together. To me, a leather holster, it goes with a 1911. Yeah, and especially a custom-built 1911. You know what I mean? Like, you oh, really, yeah. it, just, it, it, it just wouldn't look right in the pictures. And there's Absolutely. a lot of great Kydex out there. I mean, oh, I've yeah. the diminished skill of some of those guys. You know, JM Custom Kydex, I've got stuff from him, and it's fantastic, right? But nothing says 1911 like a leather holster. I agree 100%. Yeah. Well, thanks, bro. Greatly appreciate it. I know you're going to get back to the workbench. Oh, yeah. First guest ever on the Larry Vickers podcast, Jason Burton. I appreciate it. Thank you. You got it, brother. Thanks a million. I'll see you later. All right, buddy. Hey, I hope you guys... Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Jason Burton, a good friend of mine, outstanding shooter, phenomenal pistol smith out in Arizona. Website, heirloomprecision.com. You heard what he said. It may be a while before you can get one of his guns. You need to be patient. Patience is key in the custom 1911 world. I'm going to let you go. Hope you enjoyed it. As always, we'll see you back here next time on the Larry Vickers podcast. LAV out.